All right. Uh, happy Monday. Oh. Let's not play the stereotypes and start complaining, Celia, please. Let's not play the cultural stereotypes. Je sais, je sais, j'ai remarqué. All right. Um, a couple of programming notes for you uh, for tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m., the Secretary General will deliver a commencement address to the class of 2022 at Seton Hall University across the river in New Jersey. Uh, in his remarks that he will deliver the Prudential Center in Newark, the Secretary General is expected to highlight issues such as conflict, poverty, exclusion, inequality, hunger, and human rights. He's also expected to tell graduates that their generation must be the ones that succeed in addressing the planetary emergency of climate change and that they put their hard-earned talents to good use. Uh, those remarks were shared with you under embargo. You'll be able to watch uh, the remarks uh, live on UN Web TV. Uh, also tomorrow, something else you'll be able to watch. Um, the Secretary General will participate in a conversation with Tricia Shetty, the president of the Paris Peace Forum Steering Committee on the theme of preserving global cooperation in times of war. The, um, this is a pre-recorded uh, conversation, which he recorded today, and they did, the issue of Ukraine did come up. Um, that will be broadcast tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. New York time, uh, 3.30 p.m. Paris time, and you can watch it on UN Web TV, as well as the Paris Peace Forum's YouTube channel. Um, this weekend, the Secretary General spoke at the opening of the session, um, sorry, he spoke by video message, at the opening session of the World Health Assembly. Um, and this, he said that this year's uh, WHA arrives at a time when global health continues to be challenged like never before. But throughout the crisis, Mr. Guterres said, the World Health Organization has been a steadfast source of hope and support. The women and men of WHO, not only on the front lines of the COVID-19 response, they are leading the battle against other preventable diseases, safeguarding access to primary health care, and gathering the world preparedness to address and even prevent future pandemics. But across this essential work, the Secretary General said WHO needs global support and investment. He concluded by urging the international community to invest in a healthier future for all. And the Deputy Secretary General, Mina Mohammed is in Indonesia. Uh, she is in Jakarta today, where she was also yesterday. And alongside the UN's resident coordinator for Indonesia, Valérie Julien, she met with communities disproportionately impacted by disaster, as well as those working to mitigate risk. The trip comes ahead of the May 25th convening of the seventh Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction, which is being held on the island of Bali. Yesterday, the Deputy Secretary General met young people working on projects across the Indonesian archipel archipelago to mitigate the climate emergency. The Deputy Secretary General heard presentations from youth and resolved to convey the young leader's energy, frustration, optimism, and hopes to the delegates meeting in Bali. And ahead of a meeting with Indonesia's finance minister, she also met with international development partners today to discuss how to support Indonesia's transition from coal to clean energy and promote the green and blue economy. She also joined the Minister of Tourism at a roundtable on building back a sustainable tourism sector following the ravages of the pandemic. And this morning, Rosemary DiCarlo, the Under Secretary General for Peace Building and Political Affairs, spoke to Security Council members on the topic of technology and conflict. She said that digital technologies have created fresh possibilities for our peace and security work, improving our ability to detect crises, to better preposition our humanitarian stocks, and to design data-driven peacebuilding programming. She shared example of how the UN is using technology to gather information, monitor ceasefires, and engage with thousands of people in conflict areas. However, Ms. DiCarlo warned that the risks of technology has brought which includes the use of lethal autonomous weapons, using technology to target civilian infrastructure, and using social media to fuel violence and spread misinformation. She reiterated the Secretary General's own position that machines with the power and discretion to take lives without human involvement are politically unacceptable, 
morally repugnant and should be prohibited by international law. She also emphasized that tackling these risks will require multilateral actions from member states. Her remarks were shared with you. Quick humanitarian update for you from um, on Ukraine. Uh, our colleagues on the ground telling us that they remain concerned about the impact on civilians by reported fierce fighting in eastern Luhansk, Donetsk, and Kharkivsk oblasts, which is killing and injuring people and damaging or destroying homes, residential buildings, and civilian infrastructure. In the government-controlled part of Luhansk oblasts, local authorities informed that on 21 May, a bridge leading to the administrative center of the oblast, uh, Siverdonetsk, was destroyed. This left the partially encircled city reachable only by one road. While some people have managed to leave uh, Siverdonetsk over the weekend, local authorities estimate that thousands of civilians remain in the war. Uh, remain in the war affected city and require urgent support. Our humanitarian colleagues also tell us that shelling and airstrikes were reported in others, air, other areas of Ukraine, including in northern, central, and southern parts, claiming civilian lives and damaging civilian infrastructure. We remind the parties to the conflict of their obligations under international humanitarian law to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure and to allow rapid and unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief for civilians in need. And the head of our peacekeeping mission in the Democratic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Bintu Keita, has condemned yesterday's targeted attacks in um, Ruchuru territory in the province of North Kivu. These attacks were committed by the armed group M23 against members of the Col Congolese armed forces and UN peacekeepers. Following the attack, a joint operation was launched to free the area from the M23 with the priority of ob objective of protecting civilians. There's an assessment currently underway to determine the consequences of these attacks as well as humanitarian needs. Ms. Keita deplored the new displacement of populations resulting from these clashes. She also called on the M23 to immediately, immediately cease all hostilities and disarm unconditionally. The Special Envoy for Yemen, Hans Grunberg, met uh, yesterday with the diverse groups of Yemeni women, peace activists, experts in civil society and private sector actors, and other leaders as part of his efforts to consult on the framework for the multi-track peace process. The meeting also During the meeting, they also discussed the implementation and renewal of the truce. Mr. Grunberg stressed the importance of integrating the views of Yemeni women into the design of the peace process to ensure it's sensitive it is sensitive to the issues the Yemeni women and youth face. For his part, our Syria envoy, Ger Pedersen, was in Damascus on Sunday, where he met with Foreign Minister Faisal Megdad. They discussed a range of issues related to the implementation of Security Council Resolution 2254, including the serious socioeconomic and humanitarian challenges affecting the Syrian people. Mr. Pedersen told reporters afterwards that he was briefed in some detail on the latest amnesty from President Assad, and he said the amnesty is potential and that he is looking forward to seeing how it develops. Quick update from, uh, on COVID from our team in Nepal, led by the acting resident coordinator, Richard Howard, as they continue boosting efforts to tackle the impact of the pandemic. Since the onset of this pandemic, the UN team has been providing technical assistance to strengthen the country's supply chain systems and to ensure adequate cold chain capacity is in place, as well as supplying syringes, developing vaccination rollout guidelines, training health workers, and working with communities addressing misinformation. To date, 64% of the population has been fully vaccinated. On the more than 53,000 doses of, mis of vaccines received in country, some 32,000 doses were received throughout the, through the COVAX facility. The UN team has also assisted close to 40,000 people to become micro-entrepreneurs, 60% of whom are women. Also on the subject of COVID, the International Labor Organization today released a report showing that multiple crises are, are causing market deterioration, a marked deterioration in the global <laughs> labor market recovery with increasing inequalities within and between countries. The ninth edition of the ILO's Monitor on the World of Work finds that after significant gains during the last quarter of 2021, the number of hours worked globally dropped in the first quarter of 2022 to 3.8% below pre-crisis benchmark. 
This is the equivalent of a deficit of 112 million full-time jobs. ILO also notes that multiple new and interconnected global crises, including inflation, financial turbulence, potential debt crisis, and global chain disruption worsened by Ukraine means there's a growing risk of further deterioration in hours worked this year. Full report is online. Um, and as you may have seen, the UN Refugee Agency is telling us there are now 100 million men, women, and children forcibly displaced around the world. This is the first time on record that we have crossed the staggering and sobering milestone of 100 million, which has been propelled by the war in Ukraine and other ongoing conflicts. Uh, the Secretary General said that this is not a refugee crisis because refugees are not the cause. This is a political crisis, he said, and will be only solved with solidarity and political will. Over 1% of the global population, that's the overall figure, if that the overall figure is equivalent to the 14th most populous country in the world. It includes refugees and asylum seekers, as well as the more than 53 million people displaced inside their own borders by conflict, according to a recent report from the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. Lastly, today is the International Day um, to End Obstetric Fistula, which is one of the most serious and, child and tragic childbirth injuries. The UN Population Fund notes that the injury has all but disappeared in rich countries, but persists in poor countries with adequate maternal health care. According to UNFPA, an estimated 500,000 women and girls live with the condition. With many partners, UNFPA leads the campaign to end fistula, which works in more than 55 countries on prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation efforts. Edith. Thank you very much, Steph. Before I ask a question, I would like on behalf of all the resident correspondents at the United Nations to protest in the strongest terms the new restrictions that have been placed on us on using the United Nations headquarters and our offices on weekends. We believe, and we have for years, myself for 24 years, come in and out on weekends very often. Some of us use our offices to cover events related to the United Nations, related to New York, at all times, in the middle of the night, every day. And we do not understand why all of a sudden this restriction is being placed on us. Thank you. Okay, well heard and thank you for making that clear. Um, and I will look into it. My question. Um, a Russian has been sentenced to life in prison in Ukraine for killing a Ukrainian civilian. Does the Secretary General have any comment? Uh, no, we had no uh, involvement in these judicial proceedings. As a matter of principle, we do believe uh, there needs to be accountability uh, for crimes that may have been committed during this conflict. And secondly, um, Ethiopia has launched a new crackdown on journalists and activists. Does the Secretary General have any comment on that? We've seen these uh, reports which are of uh, concern to them, and we're trying to get a bit more clarification from the authorities. Celia. Stefan Benin has said that he will withdraw all his troops from the MINUSMA. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? And is it because of the French leaving uh, the country? Do we know why they do that? I mean, you know, you have to ask the people who, I, I mean, the, the motivation is with them. You have to ask them uh, why those decisions were, uh, were taken. It's not, um, it's not for me to, to interpret the decision of Benin or, or any other country. I mean, uh, it I, will have an impact on the MINUSMA. Well, right? I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, the, the units are planned to be repatriated at the end of their respective tours in November of this year and November of next year. 
uh, as requested. So obviously uh, we will look into, uh, into replacement. I mean, as you know, we strongly believe that uh, MINUSMA plays an important role uh, in Mali in support of peace and uh, stability. We're obviously very grateful for uh, the contributions that BINA has made in implementing the mission's mandate and for the services and sacrifice of their personnel. But again, as, as to why they took that decision, that's for them um, to answer. But as, as you can see, um, I mean, first of all, every member state that gives uh, human beings or material to, uh, uh, to peacekeeping mission remains sovereign and they can take them out. I think what we, we also very much appreciate that the, this is not uh, a withdrawal that is happening immediately, that is at the end of their, of their planned tour, some of them in November of this year, some of them in November of next year, which gives us time to put contingencies in plan. Yeah, Al Jazeera. So there's some reporting that also has been confirmed by Al Jazeera that the uh, Sudanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs has not renewed the residency and visas for the senior staff of UNEMIT. Uh, so I don't know if you have any comment on that. I mean, we, we've seen these, uh, these press reports. I haven't had a chance to uh, talk to my colleagues on the ground uh, today. We do believe that it is important uh, that all UN international staff receive visas uh, for the mission to be able to implement its mandate in full. And I have a second question, Please. if I can. Um, there's been also some reporting in Japanese media, and it seems that the Japanese prime minister has also said that President Biden uh, supports Japan joining, being a permanent member of the Security Council. Any thoughts that the SG might have on this? I mean, the Secretary General, is, as, his, as, have ha has, as have had his, but let me just focus on this one then. Uh, <laughs> The Secretary General, I think, has often expressed uh, the opinion that the Security Council uh, reflects uh, the you know, reflects the, the the world as it was many decades ago, uh, and that reform would be good for the organization. Um, but what that reform looks like. Who gets to sit on permanent seats, non-permanent seats, semi-permanent seats, whatever that combination, that's a decision that member states themselves will have to take. Edward, and then Linda. I have uh, two follow-ups from two different colleagues. First one is a follow-up from Edith. Uh, we know that ICC uh, sent a team, I believe, to mm -hmm. Ukraine to d investigate war crime. Any updates on that? No, uh, I mean, as you know, we, we of course, uh, fully support the, the we support the ICC as an important uh, as an important uh, role in international law, uh, uh, but they operate completely independent from the Secretariat. So you should check with them. Okay. The second follow up is from uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, we, we know that President Biden in Japan also launched the, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which even some of the U.S. officials they are very uh, they also expressed it's about an alternative to China's approach. Um, we know that many experts actually said this could spark a geopolitical um, division that probably will, will have a negative effect on the supply chain and also the recovery of the economy. Uh, I just want to know whether the, the Secretary, Secretary General has anything to say about this. He does not. So, sorry for a shorter answer to a long question. Uh, Linda. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, this is actually indirectly related to the ICC's investigating war crimes. I heard you say, and I've heard it said by, um, I think by the Human Rights uh, Council, et cetera, office, that um, you call on all parties to the conflict to abide by international law, mm -hmm. which I gather means, you know, looking at what Russia's doing, but also what Ukrainian is doing. So I guess my question is, it's, I mean, clearly it's a Ukrainian country and it's, they're in a position to report on casualties and those kind of thing. I was just wondering, on the other side, for example, like in the Donbass where there are civilians who are pro-Russian, et cetera, uh, is there any reporting perhaps by the humanitarian groups, a sense of what's happening to those civilians? Look, it, it's, it's, 
first of all, it is incumbent on all parties to uh, to respect international humanitarian law or the laws of war, to put it in, in plainer terms. I mean, there are a number of Geneva Conventions that have been, to my knowledge, almost universally uh, accepted and signed, signed on to. Um, it is a challenge for us uh, to report from those areas. Uh, our human rights colleagues uh, do so periodically. Uh, they had human rights monitors in the air. We do have international staff there. Uh, it's a challenge for us to get to them. Um, but we do understand that the, the, those populations are also suffering uh, from the conflict. Frank. Uh, Stefan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to second uh, Edie's comments about the uh, draconian and restrictive email that was sent out uh, on behalf of Malo restricting uh, resident correspondence on the weekends here. I've been here for more than two decades. I can't see a reason for this being implemented at this point. We'd really appreciate an explanation. Uh, also, a question uh, for the Secretary General and yourself. Uh, what would be the, the reaction uh, to the resignation of the Russian envoy in Geneva over the Ukraine war? That, that's a question to ask the Russian Federation. I mean, we don't. Com I mean, we don't. You know, we, we don't comment on diplomats' personal decisions to to leave their jobs. That's their own decisions. Okay, uh, there will be no Polina today, and I believe no Polina this week. Um, and I have no guests today. Uh, anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> All that to say.